Hey everybody, welcome back to Board Game Blender. My name is Z Garcia. I hope you're having a fantastic 2017 so far. It's probably just a few days old when you're watching this, but still, I hope it's fantastic. And uh, I do want to mention one more thing before we get to the episode proper. If you are watching this in January 2017, it's quite likely we have our Indiegogo campaign going right now to help us raise funds to keep the Dice Tower going, and if you feel so inclined, please go over there to Indiegogo, look up the Dice Tower. I will put a link down below as well. And uh, if you can, please support us, you know, help us continue to be a part of this amazing community. So, having said all that, today's episode, the theme is a nautical theme, and so we are calling it all aboard, because we're cute like that. And we're going to be talking about all sorts of games with nautical themes. As always, I recommend you watch this episode however you want to. Any piece that you like first, watch it front to back, use it as a reference point. As long as you discover at least one new game you have not heard about or remind you of one that you've forgotten about, then we're going to all be thrilled with that. So having said all of that, let's kick off the episode right away. Have fun. See you soon. Hello friends of the blend and welcome back to Retro Board Game Corner. Today's theme is nautical. Now every time I shoot one of these segments I always ask my mother if she has any good suggestions that I should do. Well she suggested Battleship and then I told her mom don't insult me. Here we have Subsearch published in 1973 by Milton Bradley. This is a two player game in which you're trying to find your enemy subs before they hit your ships. Let me set this up and show you how it works. So before I take you to the surface, you need to set the submarines up here at different depths here. There's the 100, 200, and 300. Now you have three submarines here that you can put anywhere you want. You can put one at the 100, one at the 200, one at the 300, or you can put two at the 200, however you want to do it. You can even put them all at the same depth level. After you set your submarines up, you get to place one mine at the 100 level anywhere you want. Now these will stay in the position for the entire game. Now let me take you back up to the surface and show you that top part of the board. So here is the surface part of the game board. The red is going to sit here with yellow submarines underneath the surface. Yellow sits over here with red submarines on the other side. Now the object of the game is to destroy all three subs or destroy all three surface ships first. Now the ships have pegs in them and the pegs just mean that that's how many depth charges each ship carries. Now every turn you're going to move one of your ships three spaces, one, two, or three spaces. You can move uh, forwards, backwards, diagonally, any way you want up to three spaces. So once you have made your mood move, you can decide if you want to drop a depth charge or not. What you do is you're going to take off one of the white pegs and name the space you're on. In this case, I'm on space number 16th. Name the level that you want to fire. In this case, I want to fire at level 100. So I'm going to say depth charge, uh, space 16, level 100. And then I'll come over here to this chart the 100 and 16 and put my white peg in. Then the other player will either say hit or miss, meaning if his sub is directly there in that exact space and in the exact uh, depth that I have called, if his ship is there, his sub there, that means that the sub is destroyed. If it's not, then his sub still lives. So after you have moved and either dropped a depth charge or not, then uh, you can decide if your sub wants to fire uh, on the ships here to try to hit it. So you see these arrows right here? If your sub is anywhere on any depth, can fire across the entire line there. So what you're going to do is you're going to spin the spinner here. And on the hit, you successfully destroy the ship. On a miss, Obviously it misses, but now the ship knows which line the submarine is in. A little bit closer to finding and destroying the sub. When your ships run out of depth charges, they need to go back to the port so they can reload with more depth charges. 
play will continue until either the three ships have found and destroyed the three subs or the three surface ships have been destroyed by the subs. Now, if at any time that the ship goes over the mine that you placed at the beginning of the game, that ship is automatically destroyed along with the mine. You only get one of these per game. What a monstrosity to set up, but let me tell you, it is well worth it once you get it all set up and all your subs in the different depths here. You really get the feel that you're trying to evade these enemy ships and these ships here are trying to find the subs. And hey, who doesn't like a game with a good spinner? Well, that's all the time I have for now. May your rolls be high. Hey guys, welcome back to another segment of How To Fun. This week it's all about games at sea. And I couldn't think of any better game to play that gives me more of a, uh, a real life at sea experience than Captain Sonar. So let's go ahead and look at the game and we'll talk about how to have more fun playing it. Captain Sonar will have you and your friends going head to head in naval combat. Each team will be comprised of four different roles sitting on either side of the screen. Their player roles include first mate, radio operator, engineer, and captain. Each role is unique and each one is necessary to win the game. Players must work together in order to defeat the enemy submarine. So first off, this game is just plain fun. I highly recommend it. It takes Battleship, a very simple, bland game, and turns it into an awesome team game with asymmetrical uh, roles for each player, and it's just, it's awesome. So, first and foremost, play Captain Sonar. That's fun in itself. But my specific tip comes more from uh, personal experience, and uh, it's something you can apply to probably a lot of games. You'll see what I'm talking about, but first and foremost, Captain Sonar, great game. So there's one thing that all of these games have in common. Terraforming Mars. Quadropolis. Legends of Andor. And Captain Sonar. All of these games come with some sort of introductory uh, variant or simplified game version. So my how-to fun tip this week is sometimes be careful skipping that. Well, it's not always necessary to uh, take it easy the first game, like a lot of these games recommend. It can be helpful. It is recommended. Um, if you were to try the real time first in Captain Sonar with players that maybe aren't quite as, um, I don't know, adept to learning new games on the fly, it may be a little much for them to handle. The game recommends doing turn by turn the first time you play uh, just so players can get used to their roles and not feel so stressed because you will feel stressed. And that, a lot of games do this. Um, it's to help make the learning process easier and help keep players from feeling overwhelmed. Now I'm not saying this is necessary for everyone because a lot of game groups uh, they're very familiar with games and mechanics and it's nothing new to them. And so you don't really need to take it easy that first game, but based on who you're playing with, I, I recommend you actually give it quite a bit of thought because having a, a stressful or very unfun experience your first time may just turn people away from playing the game again. Uh, and you don't want to do that, especially with a game as fun as Captain Sonar. So that's this week's how-to fun tip. Uh, once again, Captain Sonar is an awesome game. Play it any chance you get. But just keep in mind those you're playing with and make sure it's not too much for them that first game. Uh, if you've played Captain Sonar, I'd love to hear about your experiences. Or if you know of another game that uses this introductory type game before the advanced uh, full-blown game, go ahead and let me know in the comments below so that people can keep their eyes open for those. But until next time, keep having fun gaming. In today's quirky game, I want to take a look at a fishing game called Mare Balticum, a game set, of course, in the Baltic Sea in which the players are moving their ships. 
they are fishing, and then they are selling those fish for the most points possible before the game's over when the waters of the Baltic freeze. The first thing that stands out from the game, of course, and the first thing that makes it a quirky game is the look of the whole thing. Uh, I'm not sure if you can discern this from the footage, but everything in this game, the artwork and everything, is made from clay. It is basically molded and then photographed, which gives it a very unique, interesting, cartoony look. This almost looks like it's based on a movie that doesn't exist, and that's fantastic. The game really looks very, very uh, attractive. It's unique. Let me give you a look here at the board so you can sort of take a take a look at what I'm talking about here. Now, that does not normally translate into visibility and usability issues. Um, perhaps someone out there might have a little bit of, a, of trouble telling some areas apart, but I find it to be pretty functional. And certainly how beautiful the whole thing is, is I think worth it if it's, uh, if it's a little strange to get used to the whole thing. The second thing that makes the game a little bit strange and unique is the way in which your fleet, which is made up of these little ships here, moves on the oceans. As you can see, you start with some of these on the board and you are going to be able to move them uh, or place a new one or basically leapfrog over them as long as you move one uh, from behind and move it up to the front and they are all still connected. Second thing you can do, as I said, is fish itself, which is really simple. You have some tokens in the game that you populate the board with, and you are going to be grabbing those tokens off of the board and putting them on your own player mat. Simple as that. There are different kinds of fish, and there are some that are little clocks, and they denote the passage of time in the game. This is the game's mechanism for moving forward. Also, very simple, very clever. You are gathering these things, you are going to put them on your own board, as I said, which again has that look everywhere. Oh, has that look everywhere, and uh, this limits how much you can carry, how much you can bring back and sell at port. You are going to then just deliver that fish, and that's that. At specific points throughout the game, you are going to decide how much each kind of fish is worth to you and you'll place these times three times two times one tokens on some specific fish to uh, basically specialize in something that means you are going to try to get more of those than any other kind this simply continues until the game is over and you see who's got the most victory points they win the whole thing as i said it's a very simple game it's certainly a family weight game but one that's really unique, not just in its look, but the mechanisms are breezy, for lack of a better term. It is a game that, that moves along at a nice clip. It's not very confrontational. It has neat choices that are both simple, but far-reaching. And so the whole thing, I think, is going to appeal to kids, and I think it's going to keep the parents and the rest of the family very much entertained. If you wanted to, you could spice up the proceedings a little bit with some secret objectives, but this is an optional rule and it gives you sort of something specific to go for. You want specific combinations to get some victory points. So you can throw these in if you've played a few times or if you're not playing with any of the kids and this is going to give you a little more meat, but again, I would not say this is a deep game by any means. And so that's Mata Balticum. If you are someone that enjoys family weight games, and especially if you are someone that can appreciate the uniqueness of this look, if you are someone that is captivated by an interesting uh, concept, an attractive cover, things like that, things that I myself, uh, for lack of a better term, fall prey to, then this is one that I think you're going to want in your collection. Mata Balticum certainly a quirky game and one I recommend. The oars of the galley rose and fell as the ship pulled away from the docks. Justice looked down on the toiling slaves with pride. It had taken time, but the constant drilling had paid off. Their strokes were strong and their rhythm coordinated. While they'd not be mistaken for veterans just yet, a casual observer would never know the whole crew was fresh from the markets just two weeks ago. His thoughts wandered from the ship onto the task he had before him. 
Justice had never been to Hispania, but from what he'd heard, the fields of Valencia were fertile, and their produce would fetch a good price back in Rome. And, if the gods were with him, and he'd timed things right, he'd also be able to set up a trading agreement with the merchants of Massilia before moving on. Justice leant back against the wooden railing as the drum beat increased and the galley surged into open water. It was shaping up to be a very profitable trip indeed. Howdy folks, Rebecca and Hunter here from Two Player Showdown. Happy New Year! Today we're looking at the latest and greatest from UA Rosenberg, A Feast for Odin. This is Patchwork. If you've ever played the game Patchwork where you put little pieces on the board, meet a heavy Euro game a la Agricola or Caverna. Let's take a closer look. To me, in A Feast for Odin, UA Rosenberg took pieces of many of his previous games and kind of mushed them all together into one epic game. I mentioned in the opening that it reminds me a lot of Patchwork, and if you've ever played the game Patchwork by UA Rosenberg, you know that you take a board and you put pieces on the board to cover spaces. And that's pretty much the basis for A Feast for Odin. You have a home board that you're attempting to cover with various goods that you get by going to this main worker placement area. This area has 61 places that you can put pieces. And if you play the four player version, you get two more on top of that. <laughs> So it may seem a little overwhelming, all your options, but they're kind of divided into categories and the symbology is really easy to follow. And that may be a bit intimidating, but the game comes with a very clear and concise round overview board that will walk you through each little step of the turn and tell you exactly what you need to do. So, A Feast for Odin is a feast on the eyes. As you can see, we have cardboard galore. Each different shaped piece has four different levels that you can upgrade, whether it's from food of different types to resources that will go on your resource board to cover up. And as you fill in your board, you accumulate, you cover up more of the money spaces and accumulate that in income each turn. And you also have opportunities if you surround certain pieces of resources that you can get those for each turn as well. So besides covering up your board to get more income and resources, you can also collect livestock. You obviously have to feed your people every turn. <laughs> and there's also another section at the bottom of the board where you can accumulate ships. Those are used for anything from whaling to trading to going off and pillaging as well. Then you also have um, different shapes and different items that you can get from those um, raids or whaling and whatnot that you can use to further cover your boards. Yeah, Feast for Odin, first time we played this, we got about halfway through the game and we barely covered our board and we're like, oh man, how are you going to do this? And then, in classic UA fashion, the last few turns of the game just explode into just doing tons and tons of stuff and I, I really enjoy that. The the number of places you can put your workers seemed intimidating at first but I love having lots of options. Mm -hmm. I love trying different paths to win. It's it's an awesome, awesome epic game. Absolutely. The different choices I think is what makes this game. At first it is a little overwhelming when you first open that box the overwhelming feast of cardboard <laughs> um, and the initial setup is a bear but because they came with these handy dandy little trays you only have that horrific setup that one time and the rest of the time now it's a much much quicker process to get the game going and that makes it easier for you to get it to the table yeah I, I truly do love his games and this is sneaking up to be my favorite UA game. I, I need to play the Hav one more time to, to kind of compare and contrast, but this game is awesome. And what I like about it is it plays really fun as a two-player game. Yep. This is one of our go-tos for a big game right now. 
Yeah, I mentioned in the opening that they're really the only difference between one to three players, and it does play, it does have a solo version. At one to three players and four players is you just add two little things down at the bottom of your board down here. And what that does for you is it lets you duplicate a place another player has gone in oh, that nice. column. So only two columns each game for the four player. You can duplicate an action that someone already did. Uh, and those are randomized each game. So you're only going to have two of the four columns. There's four different columns that you can put your workers in um, that you can duplicate one, you know, one time. You can go down here and basically do an action within that column that's already been taken. That makes it really nice and easy so that you don't have a lot of complications trying to learn different rules yep. with all of this material for different players. That would be the only intimidating thing to me with this game is the sheer amount of components. They're all wonderful components and solid and you have a moose for a starting player. You can't get much better than that. But it is an overwhelming amount. Don't let that intimidate you. Like power through and I think you'll find Feast for Odin highly enjoyable. So go feast upon Feast for Odin. Thank you so much Yar! for joining. We are castaways on an island with a curse Don't worry guys, believe me, I have been through worse If we want a ship to find us, we'll need lots of wood Focus, work together, it will all be good I just found some berries, they tasted quite okay I have found a hammock that will keep the bugs away We don't need a hammock, but a roof and wood you can go explore, okay, understood. We must build a tower with the wood that we acquire. If we spot a rescue ship, light it all on fire. There were food crates at the shore. Tonight we will get by. On this cursed island are 50 ways to die. I think I need some medicine, I badly cut my hand We're focusing on rope now, I hope you understand Sure it's nothing, I'll be fine, I'll know just what to do I'll just make some palisades with snakes of bamboo I got stung by a bee, it attacked me in the grass If we would have had a hammock, this would not have come to pass I'm not feeling well, is there a place to cry? On this cursed island are a hundred ways to die. The night was freezing cold, outside the wind was blowing. We had to use all of our wood, so our wood pile isn't growing. If we want a ship to find us, no more resting, go on, run. Gather, build, explore, and hunt, we need to get things done. I have found a metal hatch, something might be inside. Help me carry this old goat, I wonder how it died. Tonight we eat stone soup, there is a fungus in your eye. On this cursed island are a thousand ways to die. Is this island tropical? The forecast is insane. Look at those freaking winter clouds, it will be worse than rain. I gathered some more wood, and now a puma found our trail. Even with a spyglass, another epic fail. Excuse me, Mr. Trevichek, let's be realistic. Maybe there's a way out, but you are plain sadistic. Using different strategies, we try, try, try. On this cursed island are a million ways to die. Hashtag board games that tell stories is a portal straight to hell. But gamers like the torture, he knows us just too well. While we think of future strategies, we're gazing at the stars. It would all be easier if we would live on Mars. Huh. Hi there, and welcome aboard this segment of Boards and Crafts, where we are going to be creating a nautical notebook inspired by New Bedford. Let's get started.
That is how you can create a nautical notebook inspired by New Bedford. If you would like to use the design that I used in this video, I will be trying to create a digital version of the template to put up on the interweb sometime between whenever this video launches or maybe a few hours after. I don't know how soon I'll be able to create it because it might take a little tweet thing because I'm not good with the digital thing. Anyways, rambling. <laughs> um, I will make sure that it is on my Twitter account. Um, <laughs> So without further ado, if you guys have any ideas for snacks or crafts inspired by any of the board games mission in this video, comment below or tweet at me at Artsy Robot. Thank you guys so much for watching and I hope that you have a fantastic day. Bye! Hello everyone! Exploring the deep seas, finding hidden treasure, and upgrading your super cool submarine. This and more is possible in a new game by Antoine Boza called Oceanos. But Oceanos sometimes encounters a problem when people are playing his game. And he's here today with the board game doctor to talk about his problem. In Oceanos, you are trying to become the king of the deep sea. The game is played over three rounds, in which all the players play cards that represent the things you find on your dive. There are different ways to score points. You can try to collect as many different sea animals as possible, use your scuba divers to collect hidden treasures, upgrade your submarine and explore the biggest reef. But watch out! If you have the most Kraken points at the end of the round, the Kraken catches you and you lose points. After the third round, everyone counts their final score and the highest score wins the game. Hello Oceanos! Hello Anna! Not much water here, eh? No, I find that board games cannot really handle water. Oh, <laughs> water is no problem for me. In my game, we use cards to let the deep sea explorers dive deeper and deeper. But on some cards, there is a Kraken. And if you're not so lucky, you only draw these kinds of cards and are not able to do anything cool with your submarine and even get minus points. You have to just sit there and see how the other people around the table are building the super cool submarines and you only have minus points. That is no fun. Mm, yes, I see how that could be a problem. Everyone should be able to win and not lose by the luck of draw. Maybe drafting would be a good idea. That would help, but not everyone gets the same amount of cards. Oh, I have an idea. Let everyone pick an upgrade at the end of the round. That way you still have some luck, which makes the game fun and unpredictable, but everyone can have an upgrade and they can even choose the upgrade in which you get more cards so that you always have a good card to pick and explore. Yes, that's an excellent idea. In the normal rules, it's already a little bit easier to upgrade at the end of a round. But this way it's fun for everyone. Thank you, Anna. I'm going to look for that ship, the Vliegende Hollander, your ancestors left for me in the deep waters. Have fun, Oceanos! Hey guys, it's Nur E here and today we are talking all about being on a boat, being a pirate, all of those nautical themes. And for this uh, segment, I have decided to pick one of my favorite games of this year that I got to play this year, even though it potentially, I think it came out last year or end of last year. It is Animals on Board. This is a game all about Noah's Ark, but you're not Noah. You're uh, someone that's kind of working against or uh, counter to what he's doing. Okay, so where am I? Like I said, you are back in the uh, Noah's Ark day. You're trying to get animals on an ark before the big flood, and you're gonna score points on the number of animals you get on your ark. The way the game works is very simple. You'll have animals on the table and you'll be able to do one of two things. Take animals by paying food for each animal you're bringing back or you'll separate the groups and each time you separate a group, you're gonna get a food. So that's your two choices on your turn. Once you get a certain number of animals on your uh, ark, then the game's gonna be over and Noah is gonna come and take any pairs of animals. If you have two zebras, then he'll take those. But if you had three zebras, he's gonna leave you alone. So let's go to the who am I? Who am I? Like I said, I am running a boat in the Noah's Ark uh, time frame, and I am ushering animals onto my boat, paying them food to come to me, or instead separating them to get a food. Now thematically that's a little strange, but that's kind of what I'm doing. 
how do I like it? Do I feel like I'm being that guy? And the how am I? Here we go. How am I? I feel pretty good about most of it. I feel pretty good that I am trying to collect these animals and I'm trying to avoid pairs. I don't want Noah to steal them from me. I, I have a little arc as my um, player area, so it really feels like I'm putting them on there. The uh, artwork of the animals is great. I feel like I'm adding them to the arc. I get to show at the end of the game my arc with the animals on it. That's fantastic. The one piece that doesn't make thematic sense as far as how the game works is separating an animal's group and then getting a, a, a food which is basically money in this game for that that doesn't really make sense thematically but other than that i really like it i really think i feel pretty well in that setting uh I'm getting those animals on board, trying to save them from the flood, and hope that I get points for those animals and that Noah, that, that greedy, greedy Noah doesn't come and take my pears away from me. So that is animals on board, and that is who am I. Thanks, guys. For today's Under the Radar game, I'm taking a look at Nautilian, which is a one or two player cooperative game in which you are diving in a submarine trying to get to a castle, something like that, some underwater structure, before the bad guys coming from that structure, coming your way, get to where you emanated from. That's basically it. It's a pretty straightforward game. This game is the fourth or fifth, depends which way you're counting, in a line of games from the same designer, uh, all of them single-player games or two-player games, all of them cooperative. And yet, so far, this one is flying under the radar quite a bit compared to all the other ones. Now, partly that's because it's very new. It's quite possible you just haven't gotten your hands on it yet. But I have here some of the previous ones, basically all of the previous ones. And I have also the ranking of these games on uh, Board Game Geek as of right now. And so the first one, Onirim or Onirim is ranked 490. The second one, Sylveon, is ranked 769, so several hundred places lower. Then after that we have Castellion, which is ranked 1342, again several hundred lower. And then Nautilion is ranked 4478. Again, with fewer rankings, I get that. But still, that's quite low. And so I wanted to make a little case for it today as to why I think you should get it. Now, the game is based on a mechanism that I think is going to push a lot of people away. It's a roll and move game. Don't run away yet. Let, let me finish. Um, the roll and move in this game is pretty interesting because you are rolling more dice than are actually needed for you and then deciding which ones go to the bad guys, which ones come to you, which one is used for something else. And so there is options there. And once you've played the base game and add some of the little expansions that come in the box, then you have even more options as to, you know, ways to manipulate those dice, other things to do with the dice, etc. And so I like that. The other thing I really like about it is the artwork in these games, also all from the same artist, in this one especially, it's, it's quite fantastic. And it features... A largely new palette with the blues and the greens uh, that the other games did not quite feature. There's a lot of green in Sylveon because it does take place in a forest. But the water theme here, the illustrations, the little characters that you are going to encounter are fantastic. It's the first dice game as well. And it's very breezy. This is one of the, um, the simplest ones to teach, I think and one of the ones that's going to take the least amount of table space. And so all of those things, I think, are uh, very strong pluses as to why you should get this if you intend to use it as a solitaire game. Something you can carry with you, something you can quickly set up, quickly enjoy, put it all away, it's not going to take up a lot of room, and uh, have a good time. You could play this on an airplane uh, tray, you know, it's that small. Because the board, or... or quote-unquote board, is free form. You just need to make a line of tokens, which is very, very simple. And so this is something you could do that with. And it is very fun. It's engaging. I, I, the rolling the dice and then seeing what you do with them, the luck that comes with that, which I always think makes a game a little bit better, elevates a game for me. And so I think this is one that if you've enjoyed the other games at all, 
you should certainly look into. Do not be scared away by the fact that it's the fourth or fifth game in the line. There are still fresh ideas here. And do not be scared away by the fact that it's a roll and move. It incorporates that mechanism in a clever and uh, engaging way. And so there you have it. That's Nautilian for the Under the Radar game for this episode. I hope if you enjoy Solitaire games that you'll give it a look. Go check out my review if you want to hear a little bit more about it or you want to see more of it. But that's it for me. Check this one out. I'll see you next time. Boop, 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 boop. Hi everybody, I'm Jess, and this is Andrew, and today, for this nautically themed blender, we want to talk about Akrotiri, a fun two-player game from Z-Man Games. It's a tile-laying game for two, as Jess just said, about exploring the ancient Aegean Sea and excavating temples. Let's take a look at how it plays. So as you can see, in Akrotiri, each player will get a really great player board, and that will show you everything you need to do on your turn and everything you can do on your turn. And I'm just going to take a quick sample turn so you see what I'm talking about. First things first, I have to expand the uh, map by adding a tile. I get to decide where it goes and as soon as a tile gets added, two resources will get added to the board. One determined by that symbol and another of my choice. And then I take my actions. And you can see I've got four actions. So. I was over here just uh, building this last temple on my last turn. So for my first action, I might sail all the way home to the main island where I can sell these for a profit if I want. And then for my second action, I might come all the way over to here to this island. Now, let's say I'm trying to work on this card. And I think this spot is described by this card. Two volcanoes to the south, two forest spaces to the west, and at least one mountain to the north. I pay my six drachma to the bank, take a temple, and excavate it there. Whatever it uncovers determines how many actions I'll get next round. That goes into my score pile, and there's a sample turn. And that's a typical turn. So, what do you think? I like the game. It's a lot of fun, and my favorite aspect of it is the puzzle aspect of it. So not only are you laying tiles to try to fulfill your maps, but you're also trying to optimize your trade routes. Right, because the game has this really simple economy where when tiles come out, goods come out too, and goods are worth more, the more of them are out on the islands and not in the port. So sometimes it's actually worth you know, racing back to the main island to sell your goods before anybody else can manage to, uh, to kind of mess with the economy a little bit and, and fix your income. I like it a lot because as you build the temples or excavate them, you get more and more actions, and so you, yeah. can, um, you can plan these much more complicated turns, and you're always trying to balance whether you're going to um, go for the simple maps that just let you kind of spam out a couple of temples early so you get those bonus actions, or to hold out for the higher value uh, maps that are going to be worth a lot more points uh, at the expense of them taking a lot longer to set up. And that's Aquatiri. It's a really fun date night game. Yeah, it's light, it's fun, it's fast, and it's uh, it's really nicely made. Great bits. Anyway, I'm Andrew, this is Jess from Gameosity, and we'll see you next game. Folks, welcome back to another Real Talk segment on The Blender. Thanks for being a friend of The Blend. This theme is a nautical theme. And so I went with a couple of games that really have been overlooked, I think, in my opinion. Uh, they are great games, in my opinion. Uh, I think they are worthy of being looked at, which is why I'm showcasing them on my segment today. The first one is this little guy right here. It's called Pirates of the Seven Seas. Now, Pirates of the Seven Seas has a very similar mechanic to uh, Rattle Battle Grab the Loot, where you are rolling dice into the top of the uh, game box and then how close they are in proximity to one another determines which uh, die or ship fights the other ones and then the pips on the dice are are how strong that ship is and and so there's a lot of similarity in that one uh, so there's a lot of similarity in that particular mechanic uh, to rattle battle grab the loot 
didn't like it in Rattle, Rattle Battle Grab the Loot, but I really enjoyed it here because it wasn't as fiddly. As you can see, the, uh, the box top for this one is not very large at all. So uh, you can easily see with Rattle Battle Grab the Loot, there was a high box cover and it was you had to kind of stand up to crane your neck and all this other kind of stuff. So it just didn't work very well. Kind of felt clunky in Rattle Battle Grab the Loot here it felt streamlined, but it's basically the same mechanism. Uh, other than that, there's a whole lot of other things. There's um, uh, there's variable player powers, there's uh, role selections, there's all kinds of different things in this one. It's really a fun game, and I feel that it's been overlooked, criminally overlooked. So if you have a chance, you should go check this one out. It's a very fun game. Pirates of the Seven Seas. The next nautically themed game that I'm going to showcase today is actually a, a historically uh, based game. It's called Empires at Sea. Now, Empires at Sea is where uh, each player can take the role of different um, colonial nations like England and uh, the Americas, um, Spain, Netherlands, uh, all of these different kinds of uh, nations, and you are uh, trying to colonize new ports on the other side of the Atlantic. Here, there's a few islands in the Atlantic that you're colonizing as well, all the way down to uh, the uh, northern coast of Africa, all this kind of stuff, and it's a really fun, historically, nautically themed game, and it has some event cards in it that uh, really give you the historical flavor, but not so much so that it just kind of turns it into a history lesson. It really keeps the flow, the, the effects that the event cards have. While historic, they're also very uh, game-wise uh, friendly as well. So I think there's a lot of good stuff in this. Um, it was a crowdfunded publish. Uh, publish uh, some. Blah, blah, blah. It was a crowdfunded publishing, so maybe that's part of why it's been overlooked. It hasn't had a whole lot of buzz afterwards, uh, so there's a lot of good things about this game. It is very simple to play. It's not very uh, complex or convoluted or anything like that, which may have turned some people off. It looks like a complex game. It looks like it's going to have a lot of rules to it, but the rule book is very simple. Um, so I think people should really be looking at this game. Problem is, I don't know how easy it is to find it right now. So uh, again, if you have the chance, if you see it sitting on a shelf somewhere, give it a try. Maybe buy it. Don't know. It's up to you. But look, sorry if it's hard to find. I'm just trying to keep it real, y'all. So move along. And that's going to be a wrap for us on this episode. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you to all my contributors. I hope you've had fun. I've had fun. We hope to see you again in a couple of weeks for our next episode. So, as always, play some games and, hey, stay a friend of the bland. I'll see you.